David, you're muted. There we go. You hear me okay? Yes, great now. Okay, and the slides are showing? Yep. Okay, let me just back it up here a little bit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So let me move that. So I'm uh, David Bartecki. I'm a director of Village Earth. We're a, a nonprofit here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And um, we're, we are, uh, one of our projects is called the Native Land Information System and the Native Lands Advocacy Project. <clears throat> and this was um, born out of work we've been doing for about 20 years in Indian country. Um, starting out on the Pine Ridge Reservation, working on uh, really practical agriculture uh, um, issues, land land use, and buffalo restoration. And uh, over time, it's evolved into this really data and mapping project, a nationwide project. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Native Lands Advocacy Project. But before I go too far, I want to just announce that we are um, we currently just announced two paid internship positions and one staff position that we're hiring for. So those are available on our website at nativeland.info. <clears throat> so um, to begin, I just wanna focus a little bit on uh, the Native Lands Advocacy Project is, is a nationwide focus. So we're, we're focused on all native lands, including Alaska and Hawaii. <clears throat> and th this is a map of uh, 2020 native lands in the US. Today, there's about 66 million acres of lands in trust, held in trust for 574 recognized Indian tribes and individuals. Approximately 46 million acres of this land is used for farming and grazing and uh, for livestock and game animals. However, Native Americans are not the primary beneficiaries of their agricultural lands. And this is one of the the primary focuses of our, our project here. So uh, this is the most recent ag data for reservations from uh, 2017. And this is one of the dashboards on our site. We, we developed these dashboards using Tableau. So um, this is showing the market value of agricultural products sold by race on all reservations in the United States. And as you can see, Native Americans only collected 12.89% of the agriculture revenue, where non-natives uh, collected 87%. Uh, and that is, just to remind you, that's on native lands. So on reservation lands, this is the state of agriculture. <clears throat> now, if we, uh, one of the projects we worked on with the uh, Indian Land Tenure Foundation with support from the Indian Land Tenure Foundation was trying to calculate the lost agricultural potential of native lands. So if we look back, we project backwards, looking at that um, uh, agricultural revenue collected on agricultural lands on reservations, we came up with the figure of um, $874 billion dating back to uh, 1843, of course, the majority of that was, was after 1890s, as you can see in the graph below. The orange is the revenue collected by non-natives and the red collected by natives. So huge disparity. And you know you have to think about this as in terms of uh, the revenue that wasn't there to help develop native economies, that this money was essentially extracted out of those economies by non-native farmers and ranchers and really, I'm going to talk about how this happened and, and where this happened and, and how, why it still exists today. It's been going on since the formation of reservations and hasn't changed very much since that time. Um, to start off, I always like to give some perspective. Uh, this is a map from uh, a website called nativelands.ca. And uh, the, the reason I like it is because it shows all the the original territories of different indigenous groups, and it shows them overlapping, which is, you know, 
indicative of the, the fluid nature of those boundaries. And, you know, this was prior to the imposition of strict boundaries and, and the concept of nation states that was imported from Europe um, and imposed upon native people. So the, the foundation of that colonization that occurred really came from what was called the Papal Bulls. And this was issued by Pope Alexander VI, which asserts the right to colonize, convert, and enslave non-Christian inhabitants of the, of the Americas. So the basis of that was, was completely unjust. <clears throat> This is a map, and one thing to remember is under the doctrine of discovery, um, which was sort of a, a, a combination of, of the papal bulls and uh, European common law, but under the doctrine of discovery, European countries who discovered, quote unquote, a new territory have the right to dominion, but not possession. European com commonly actually, uh, Euro European common law actually recognized Aboriginal title, which is considered just as sacred as fee simple title. That's the kind of title that, that most of us are familiar with when you purchase a house or purchase land. That's known as fee simple. So through their discovery, Europeans gained the right to extend dominion over a territory, but not the right to extinguish Aboriginal title. Therefore, during the period of 1784 to 1894, the U.S. created various treaties and later congressional orders to extinguish Aboriginal title. Most, if not all, these treaties and acts were ne either negotiated unfairly or broken. Um, and then later in 1886, the Supreme Court in the infamous Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, Hitchcock ruling ruled that Congress had plenary power over tribes, which means it alone has the power to create or cede native lands and even break its past treaties and agreements with tribes. So this map is, a, is a, of land sessions from 1784 to 1894 and shows just these were the negotiations in which uh, these lands were ceded. And like I said before, many of which were, were negotiated unfairly or broken and, and uh, have numerous or are still being contested today. So this was the, the uh, shape of native lands as of 1833. Um, in 1887, Congress passed the General Allotment Act which, with the intent to break down tribal social structures and transform native subsistence production into individual commodity production. They did this by partitioning the remaining native lands into 160 acre parcels and allotting those parcels each head of household. Consequently, all the remaining lands were classified as surplus and either ceded or open for settlement by homesteaders. In addition, subsequent acts under the Dawes Act allowed for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to lease native lands out if they deemed someone to be incompetent, which by any records we can find was a completely racist designation. Um, so in the ensuing years, uh, uh, this is a map of homesteading. So once those treaties were negotiated or treaties or congressional acts, which opened up Indian lands, which extinguished that original Aboriginal title, those lands were opened up to homesteaders. So here's a map of, of uh, homesteaders, uh, of homesteading in Colorado after, I think this is 1876 or eight, maybe 1864, sorry. The, um, as you can see, Fort Collins in here and this whole area. Um, this was negotiated under the Treaty of Fort Wise, which is a highly contested treaty. And of course, this is South Dakota. And for example, this is the Pine Ridge Reservation down here. And these are lands on the boundary, within the boundaries of the contemporary reservation that were opened up to homesteaders. So this allowed for a flood of non-native farmers and ranchers onto some of the best prime, uh, prime agricultural lands. In fact, we've mapped the quality of the lands using the soils data and showed that there's a, uh, not basically non-native lands, the, the lands that were opened up to non-native homesteaders were of, of higher quality than the lands that were uh, opened up for allotment. 
So if you look at nationwide, we use that same uh, tool we created, which was called the Lost Agriculture Revenue Database, which is based off of agricultural census data. And uh, we created a tool where you can put any geography in the continental United States and extract agricultural revenue going back to 1840. So here we did that with all land sessions from uh, from, uh, that were mapped by Royce from the, the previous map that I showed you. And you can see here, it totals $16 trillion, over $16 trillion that has been extracted from these lands through uh, sessions that were unfairly negotiated in most cases. Um, so the Dawes Act really set the stage for, uh, after the establishment of reservations, it allowed for basically non-natives to, to come in and, and overtake agriculture on those reservations. In 1928, the Miriam Report uh, excoriated the federal government's mismanagement of native people and their lands under the Dawes Act and argued that the quote unquote leasing of Indian land should be materially curtailed. The Miriam Report was influential on the adoption of restrictions on the fee patenting and liquidation of Indian lands but the practice of leasing continued to this day. Again, 1934, uh, this report is, did a huge uh, analysis of Indian lands across the United States. Uh, it was commissioned by um, the president and also sharply criticized the Bureau of Leasing Operations. The Office of Indian Affairs, here's a quote from the report. The Office of Indian Affairs has for 30 years been doing an enormous real estate business selling and leasing the lands of its wards with the income from the operations constantly decreasing while the cost of real estate transactions multiply. The report calls for the restoration of 25 million acres to enable tribes to become self-sufficient. Again, that wasn't enough to change it. 18, or, sorry, this is 1976, not 1876, but <coughs> this report also identified the problems with agriculture on reservations, um, arguing that the BIA's preference for leasing keeps it from designing an agricultural development program. As a result, lack of capital and technology continue to plague Indian farmers and the BIA continues its leasing activities. So despite all these internal criticisms from the government, very little changed over the years. Um, Again, sorry, I missed the date there, but this is 1993. This is the American Indian Agricultural Resource Management Act. And this was finally an attempt to put more control over land management into the hands of Native Americans. The problem is that it created a, a the guideline for that to happen was that tribes had to one, create uh, an integrated resource management plan or an agricultural resource management plan, which was you know, requires a lot of technical capability and, and uh, agricultural information, which the government really just did not collect. It did not collect or report on agriculture data from essentially the Miriam report to uh, the 2000s. And that's um, something that we're trying to address with our, our website. So for example, uh, what we're working on today with the native land information system is we have funding from um, the Kellogg Foundation and the Native American Ag Fund and um, to develop data tools that can be used by tribes to uh, essentially create these integrated resource management plans and agricultural resource management plans. So these are really the step for tribes. If, if tribes wanna take control over the leasing and agriculture management, they first have to submit and have approved these plans. And so we're developing uh, data tools that, that uh, a tribe can do that without, you know, our goal is to, to make it to where a tribe doesn't really need um, to employ an, a, a GIS staff or hire consultants to do this, that they have the capability within their own to do it and, and with that low cost. And so we're taking existing agriculture data. In a lot of cases, we're having to re-aggregate it for um, native lands. So where a lot of data you can get for county and state level, that same data doesn't exist at the reservation level. And so what we're doing is re-aggregating it uh, at, the, at the reservation level. And then uh, 
all of this is freely available on our website and we're putting the sorry about that we're putting the raw data as well on there creating an open open data portal so we're working on this project in partner with the intertribal ag council and uh we're basically developing the, the the data tools and they are working with us on identifying which data is what what are the data needs and then also doing outreach to tribes to to make these tools um bring, raise awareness about the tools so that is what we're working on we are looking for um uh we're hiring a staff member and we're also hiring two in or i guess three interns um one to help with data uh, data analysis. We're looking for a, a data visualization intern. Um, as you can see, a lot of the dashboards and maps we use Tableau, but we're also looking at um, developing more um, story maps using ArcGIS Online and uh, more online mapping. So anybody with skills in that those areas, definitely get in touch. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. Um, another great talk. And I think we have time for a few questions if there are any. <laughs> 